Holy City Center Radio, it is episode 235, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Wednesday, March 13th, 2024. Hopefully this 13th day of the month is not unlucky for you. I know it's not Friday, so, but still, sometimes you just want to avoid that 13, don't you? I hope you're having a great week, had a fantastic weekend. I also hope you enjoyed Monday's episode. It was another interview. I've been so happy to be able to speak with uh, people more consistently uh, so far this year, uh, you know, really get in the swing of things with the podcast and being able to, you know, more regularly schedule people. And it, it's been great. I hope you I hope you have all enjoyed them as well. Uh, today, we're going to get ca- caught up on some of the latest stories. Do you want to give you a quick heads up? Uh, I am thankfully uh, taking another trip this week and into the weekend a little bit, but this time going back home to Connecticut, uh, see my family. Nothing special, uh, just a, a trip. I haven't been home since the holidays and uh, was able to secure a pretty cheap flight and uh, happy to go home and see the family. Uh, so not sure what our plans are. Hopefully, you know. I'm totally fine just laying low the whole time, but we have, uh, you know, around the holidays when I went back, we did do some fun things. So if we do anything kind of fun, I'll let you know in case any of you ever want to travel up that way. And I recommend you do, especially in the summer and fall. It's perfect up in Connecticut and New England in general. Uh, But I say that not to just talk about myself, but also to let you know that I am still planning on having episodes on Friday and Monday as normal, even though that overlaps with my trip as far as my recording schedule anyway. Uh, But there is a chance that the episodes may not come out if I get caught up. Um, Who knows what, you know, every time I take a trip, I'm like, I'm going to record the whole time. And then, you know, inevitably I'm busier than I think I'm going to be or, you know, having too much fun with the family. Uh, I know like one time we were just caught up watching a movie with my brother's family, the kids. It was too fun. I'm not going to (laughs) record, you know, break away to record during that. So we'll see. I'm planning on having episodes as normal, but just a heads up in case you notice it missing from your feed on Friday and or Monday. But the plan is to bring you uh, shows as normal. So without any further delay, let's get you into today's show. Well, um, we'll keep this brief. We talked about it on Friday's episode. Uh, obviously, with the interview on Monday, we didn't talk about any news that day. But it did become official after I recorded last Friday's episode. Uh, Governor McMaster indeed did sign H thirty five ninety four, which is the constitutional carry bill. Uh, he signed that into law. So with his signature officially now, a person aged eighteen or over who is legally allowed to own a handgun. Uh, is now able to do so with what's called um, being able to openly carry, meaning they don't need a concealed weapons permit or training of any kind whatsoever. I won't harp on this because we've talked about it multiple times, and like I said, on Friday's episode. So if you want all the like more in-depth details of this bill, go ahead and listen to that episode. But in addition to what I just said, uh, the other couple key points is the law carries tougher penalties for people who illegally carry a gun. Um, And it is still illegal to carry a gun in government buildings, courts, and schools. In addition to that, um, private businesses are allowed um, to, you know, say they don't want you to carry. Uh, So that is allowed. So private businesses, if they have something posted, that is their right to do so. Um, But regardless, government buildings, courts, and schools still do not allow guns. We've already talked about this, um, and we'll be sure to talk about it more in the future as we see the inevitable fallout um, from this. There's a study uh, that was put out. John Hopkins uh, didn't do this study, but uh, they're the, if you just search for like concealed carry, crime rates, things like that. That's the first link that tends to come up. This has better SEO, I guess. Uh, But it showed that... um, Violent crime increases, uh, has increased in states that have open carry, uh, firearm-related activity, which makes sense. There's going to be more guns out there. Obviously, firearm-related crime is going to go up as well. So you can deep dive into some of those statistics. Maybe we'll talk about them later. But the bottom line is there's been a couple studies done uh, that show that crime actually increases in places uh, that have open carry or constitutional carry. Uh, So again, feel free to look at those on your own, uh, but there's a few things out there with details on what exactly increases and, and, and to what extent. The conspiracy theorists are all lit up over these last few days because there is a suspicious in their idea, a death that occurred 
involving a, a former Boeing employee. Obviously, not a funny situation, but it's just classic, you know, conspiracy theorists. Oh, something must be going on. Well, here's the details if you somehow miss the news. A, a former Boeing employee who raised concerns about the company's alleged safety problems was found dead in Charleston on Saturday. Uh, this was first reported by the BBC. Not sure how they beat all U.S. media outlets and specifically Charleston-related media outlets, but they did. Uh, and the Charleston County Coroner's Office on Monday morning, or I'm sorry, on Monday night, confirmed the Monday morning report from the BBC um, regarding the death. Uh, so the coroner's office said that John Barnett, who was 62 years old and from Louisiana, was found dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. The Charleston Police Department is in the investigating agency, but no other further information was available on Monday. They added a little bit to it on Tuesday, but nothing really uh, as far as the case itself. So why are the conspiracy theorists talking about that? Well, yes, he's a whistleblower. Uh, Boeing, uh, you know, Barnett actually worked for Boeing for more than three decades. He retired in 2017 uh, and was reportedly, uh, according to that BBC report, he had been giving evidence in a whistleblower lawsuit against the company in recent days. So obviously he's a whistleblower. He's currently in the process of giving um you know, providing evidence, testimony, whatever you'd like to call it in a lawsuit about alleged safety problems at Boeing. And then he shows up dead. Uh, and the reason, you know, even though the coroner's office is saying it appears to be a death by suicide, obviously people are all spinning out about, no, it's, you know, this is a setup. It's, he's framed. They did it. You know, you know how these things go. Boeing, for their part, released a short statement just saying that they are saddened by the passing and that their thoughts are with his family and friends. So according to the Charleston Police Department, officers were called to, to conduct a welfare check at the Holiday Inn on Savannah Highway just before 10.30 a.m. on this past Saturday. When they arrived, they found Barnett inside a vehicle with a gunshot wound to his head and was pronounced dead at the scene. The uh, police also released a statement that basically was like, we understand the global attention this case has garnered, and it is our priority to ensure that the investigation is not influenced by speculation, but is led by facts and evidence. Given the sensitive nature of the investigation, we are unable to participate in media interviews at this time. And quote, they went on to say that not doing media interviews is not specific to this case that is standard procedure for them because they want to you know make sure they are protecting the integrity of uh, an investigation that is active uh and so you know basically saying like this is normal everybody calm down we're gonna look into it we are going to you know make sure that this is indeed what the coroner said it appears to be um and, and you know basically telling the conspiracy theories theorists to calm down a little bit so if anything significant comes out of this i'll be sure to update you bottom line whether conspiracy theorists turn out to be true for once or not uh obviously a, a devastating death i'm sure for his family and friends and uh, people's thoughts should be with them regardless of what exactly happened and, and i certainly get why others on the outside may think this looks suspicious but let the police do their work it doesn't appear anything suspicious happened um, but if if there is, they'll be sure to share it with the media and then, you know, it'll you guys would be able to hear it at that point in time. But that's the latest on that story. A state Senate committee um, will consider legislation that will dramatically change the authority of state health officials during any possible future public health emergencies such as pandemics or a biological terror attack. So this committee is going to meet on March 14th, which, of course, will be Thursday to consider this legislation. Now, this potential legislation has been called the Medical Freedom Act by supporters, and the bill would prohibit the state's health department from securing or and distributing vaccines or other drugs during a public health crisis unless they have received full FDA approval. Uh, and of course, for those who don't remember all the drama with COVID vaccines, and in, in learning about these processes, getting FDA approval is complex. It's a regulatory process, and it can often take years. However, in 2021, COVID vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna were produced and distributed under an FDA emergency use authorization, which basically just kind of like streamlines the review process during declared national health emergencies. So when 
there is a dire situation going on, you know, such as the COVID-19 pandemic and whatever you think about certain decisions the government made during that time, there's no doubt that we lost a lot of people, not just in this country, but worldwide because of the disease or the virus. And so although it didn't go through the full normal process, the FDA still essentially signs off on it and says, hey, look, everything we've seen so far, everything looks good. Not to mention that the the process for this vaccine is one we're very familiar with uh, and how it works with other vaccines. So we're going to say there's an emergency youth author, use authorization. This isn't our full approval. We like that process takes years, but we think this is safe for you to take. And that's what happened with the vaccines. And for a while, anybody who wanted them could get that. I mean, obviously you might've had to wait. I remember, especially at the beginning, a lot of people really wanted the vaccine. And so some folks had to wait a while. I totally get that. But the point was, if you wanted it, you were able to get it at some point, you weren't forced to. Some of that changed when certain businesses implemented uh, requirements in any event. That's what they're looking to do is to shut that down. So in the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, those vaccines would not have been available to anyone and would have had to wait until the full FDA approval, which means it could have taken years, which means we could have still be in lockdowns and things like that as we awaited this vaccine. Critics of the legislation, obviously I am one of them, <laughs> uh, say this emergency authorization process that they used during the COVID-19 pandemic saved tens of thousands of lives because it got vaccines quickly to people across the country. And as we've seen, these vaccines were safe and effective. And as the years have gone by, actually, it's only been, you know, depending on when you want to mark it. Uh, but since the vaccines came out in 2021, we're looking at essentially three years. I'm not sure if we're quite at the exact three-year mark yet, but almost three years of many, many people across the globe having these different vaccines and they are safe and effective. Are there outliers? Are there some people who may have had issues? Of course, happens with all medications, even some of the most benign medications we have. Uh, but they are safe and effective. And if we weren't didn't have access to those, more people would have died because they wouldn't have been able to get vaccinated and maybe they would have caught COVID or even if they still caught COVID after getting vac vaccinated, it would have been worse. And so it seems ridiculous that we we would prevent people from wanting to do this. I understand concerns about vaccine requirements. I get people being wary of that, but this isn't a requirement. It's just saying, you know, when there's this emergency use authorization comes out, if you want to get it, go ahead. Why would you prevent that from people who want that? They always talk about, you know, freedom uh, to make decisions about vaccines and your health care and stuff like that, except abortion, of course. Uh, but or gender affirming care. Uh, but that was their push with the vaccines and stuff. So why would you stop that process for people who want to do it? You don't want to get the vaccine. Don't you're afraid of, um, having requirements to get the vaccine. Well then tackle that. Don't prevent the rest of us who trust science and want to, you know, get a vaccine. If something were to come up in the future, don't prevent us from being able to do that. That completely is at odds at your whole argument, about how people should be able to make those decisions. So this legislation, uh, no surprise, was proposed by a conservative upstate uh, member of the legislature, Senator Shane Martin. Uh, this legislation would also limit health officials' powers to order and enforce quarantines, restrict the right of pharmacists to refuse to fill prescriptions, and it would outlaw vaccine mandates by private employers for vaccines without FDA approval. So there's the, the mandates. Those stuff, I, I understand more of their concern of that. Again, it shouldn't prevent the state from distributing it to people who want it. I also disagree with the, a lot of that last part, FYI, but I, I understand uh, their thought process on that, even if I disagree with it. So this could be a really dangerous thing if it's passed. If we somehow go through any other sort of pandemic again in our lifetimes, or there's some kind of biological terror attack, uh, attack this could prevent people in the state who want to get a vaccine if it comes out from getting it when it is ready for an emergency use. And, and that is just incredibly wrong. And again, completely at odds of what their entire argument was during uh, the COVID uh, quarantines, lockdowns, the pandemic, 
We want to make our own decisions. We want to be able to go out and about if we want to. We don't want a vaccine, so we're not going to get it. You shouldn't force us to. Well, now you're going to force people who do want it to not be able to get it as early as they want. And that is, again, just completely hypocritical. Do you remember Bowen Turner? You may not remember the name, uh, but this just horrible man, if you even want to call him that, is back behind bars. The Orange Count, Orangeburg County man uh, who was accused of sexually assaulting three teenagers in as many counties in dozens of bond violations has been arrested again less than four months after he was released from prison and put on probation. For those who remember this story, this is absolutely no surprise that he's already back in trouble and he probably should have been in jail a lot longer, as many people were saying at the time. Turner is now 21 years old, and he was booked into the Florence County Detention Center on Saturday night. Um, this is according to jail records. The South Carolina Highway Patrol arrested him, um, and he's facing five different charges. These include driving under the influence, having an open container of beer or wine in a car, public disorderly conduct, a seatbelt violation, and then also one undisclosed pending charge. I'm not quite sure what that's about, but I will certainly update you um, if it comes to light. Turner it was still under active supervision at the time of his at his uh, at the time of his arrest. Excuse me. He was released from prison on November 15th after spending nearly 16 months behind bars, and he was originally going to be staying on probation until May 2025. Um, that's going to change here as it works its way through the courts. So Turner was first accused of sexually assaulting two teenage girls back in 2018. And then when, while he was out on bond for that second case, he was charged with the rape of a third teenager. While a judge had placed Turner on house arrest with an ankle monitor, court documents show that he violated the conditions of his bond more than 50 times, five zero times, to do things like go to golf courses, restaurants, sporting goods stores, and he even traveled across state lines. So despite getting bond on a second case involving allegedly sexually assaulting a teenage girl, so there's one case, he gets bond on the second case. That's a little iffy in and of itself. He ends up being charged with rape on the third. Gets put on house arrest, violates that 50 times. And in the end, he spent about 16 months in prison from all that. Prosecutors in Turner had reached a deal in April of 2022, exchanging his criminal sexual conduct charge in one case for first-degree assault and battery, to which he pled guilty. He received a probation sentence under the Youthful Offender Act, which requires offenders to be younger than 25 and clear of any previous convictions under the act. However, a month into his probation... Turner was arrested and charged with disorderly conduct, possession of alcohol by a minor, and threatening a public employee. Court documents show specifically that Turner threatened to bite off the finger of an Orangeburg County deputy when the deputy informed him of the jail's COVID protocols, which required Turner to wear a mask. A judge revoked his probation in July of the same year. This is, yes, you know, he was under 21 and actually under the age of 18 when some of these things happened, but it was clear that there was a, a pattern of just running afoul of the law and he was not given enough jail time. He was not, you know, punished properly for violating conditions of his house arrest and things like that. And no surprise, he hasn't learned a thing. And just four months after being released is already arrested again. Most of his arrests, I shouldn't say most, because we don't know all the details of the um, sexual assault and rape accusations, but he has a pattern of being arrested for alcohol related issues as well. This is a person who has a lot of issues and needs help, but also shouldn't be in the public anytime soon. If ever again, I mean, I'm not saying this guy necessarily deserves a life sentence, but good Lord, the system completely failed on this one and hopefully they get it right this time around. All right. The other big story, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about it and you know, I'm going to, uh, <laughs> Representative Nancy Mace. National Nancy strikes again. So first, uh, all her groveling has worked. That sad video outside of Trump Tower a few years ago when Trump endorsed Katie Arrington, who was running against Mace in a primary. 
her groveling at his feet, reversing course, saying, you know, going from after January 6th, saying he shouldn't hold office ever again, uh, to endorsing him, uh, supporting him, uh, floating rumors that she's going to be the VP, all that crap. It all worked because she got the endorsement of Trump. Uh, he, the former president, uh, endorsed her officially as she seeks her third term in Congress. This happened on March 9th. Uh, Trump announced the endorsement on his, you know, wannabe Twitter social media company called true social. All right. So that happens March 9th. Then, you know, as she, uh, she's endorsed him, Trump's endorsed her. Obviously she's all on board the Trump train. Fine. Whatever. No surprise. She flip flops, changes her mind, goes whichever way the wind blows. We know that. Um, she appeared this past Sunday in ABC news and completely lost it. When host George Stephanopoulos started asking her about how she could support Trump Specifically, the segment started with Stephanopoulos playing a clip of Nancy Mace in Congress talking about how uh, she had been raped when she was 16, the shame she felt from that, everything that went along with that horrific event. And it was at that time she was giving this speech as it tied into the abortion bans that were being discussed and how she felt there should be exceptions specifically for rape and incest life of the mother, et cetera. So she publicly came out and mentioned this um, in a way to say, this is why I believe these things should be in legislation. Hey, props to her for having the courage to speak out about something that must be unspeakably horrific. Um, I believe that it happened. Um, and it, it's really horrible that that happened to her. Uh, and it was valiant of her to stand up and talk about it. And, use it as a way to try to fix a bill that had problems or legislations that could potentially have problems and needed to be fixed. So that clip is played. And then George Stephanopoulos, Stephanopoulos, sorry, asked her as a rape victim, how could she could support Donald Trump who putting aside the fact he's been accused of sexual assault and rape by dozens of women. I forget the official total but specifically had been found liable in civil court for the sexual assault of writer E. Jean Carroll. So not just accusations, even though accusations don't mean they're not true. Uh, but in addition to those accusations, he had actually gone to a civil court and a jury of his peers had found that he was liable for sexual assault. She lost her mind immediately, claiming Quote, I'm not going to sit here on your show and be asked a question meant to shame me about another potential rape victim. I'm not going to do that. End quote. She continued to go on and, and consistently said, you're trying to shame me. You're trying to rape shame me. Um, this is despicable. Uh, and, and that was basically the whole interview. And he was, uh, you know, trying to just basically have her answer the question. When she finally stopped saying, hey, you're shaming me, you're shaming me. Um, she finally answered the question, which was basically... Uh, that she felt because it was civil court, she basically implied it's not a criminal court. So that's why she can support him. She also said he was not found liable for rape. Uh, it was sexual assault, as if that makes it better somehow. And then herself went on to shame E. Jean Carroll, uh, taking her to task in her mind for joking about the verdict. You may remember Carroll was saying like, oh, she can't wait to use this money to, you know, the money that uh, Trump is supposed to pay her for not just the sexual assault, but also for defaming her um, before uh, the trial. And then he continued to defame her. And so he was found guilty of defaming her further and owes her even more millions of dollars because of that. And she made some joke, like, I'm going to use this money to make his life hell uh, and, and alluded to like donating to causes or candidates that would oppose him and be a thorn in his side, that kind of thing. So after saying you shouldn't shame someone, how could you, how dare you? She then shames E. Jean Carroll and how she responded uh, to her rape and how or sexual assault officially, according to the civil court. But E. Jean Carroll has said she was actually raped. And. So she goes on to shame someone after saying it's despicable to shame someone. Um, look, she's entitled to her opinion. He's not shaming her. He's definitely not shaming. Well, specifically, he's not shaming her for being raped. That is horrific. Uh, and that is not what he was doing. He was asking her a question. How can you support a candidate? 
I mean, period. You should be asking anybody who supports a candidate who's been found liable for sexual assault, how you can square that. How can you vote for this person who's been found liable for sexual assault? But because she had been vocal in the past, granted, it was that, I mean, she's mentioned it a few times, but that was the one time she really talked about the incident publicly as it relates to politics. How is this an out-of-bounds question? I, I, I'm i sorry. It's not. And this is not me trying to mansplain. Just watch the interview yourself. And I've talked to friends. I've seen opinions online. And, and plenty of women, including Eugene Carroll, uh, said that this questioning is not out of line at all. And that they they understood it. Why someone would be asked that, specifically someone who is a victim themselves. Um, and so no surprise, National Nancy went on to make this like her entire personality. This is multiple, what are we, you'll be listening to this on Wednesday, but as of this recording, she is still tweeting and retweeting everything about George Stephanopoulos and just, it, it's ridiculous. She even said that Trump should sue him. It all, it's just, it's become her entire Twitter feed. Why is it because she's actually so upset? No, of course not. She wants attention. She doesn't care if it's negative or positive. We've talked about this before. It's documented from former members of her staff. This is what she wants. She wants confrontation. She wants something that'll keep her in the news. And so she's really digging in her heels and really, really, really just trying to make this um, something that brings her attention. And yeah, there's people who agree with her. uh, But by and large, most people see this for what it is. And again, This should take nothing away from what happened to her. Everyone should should, should believe her. Uh, But we're not talking about the incident itself. We're talking about her response and being unable to answer a question that is completely legitimate, was not out of bounds at all, and then defends her position of supporting him by claiming, oh, it was just sexual assault and it was just civil court as if that means it's not as bad as a rape in a criminal court or a sexual assault in a criminal court. Oh, it's civil. So less burden of proof, which is true. There is less burden of proof, but basically implying that she doesn't believe E. Jean Carroll shames E. Jean Carroll for her response. What she should have done is what E. Jean Carroll did, which was later that day. She, first of all, she thanked Stephanopoulos for defending her And then instead of taking a shot at Nancy Mace or anything like that, all she said was, I wish Representative Nancy Mace well, and I salute all survivors for their strength, endurance, endurance, and holding on to their sanity, end quote. She took the high road, letting Nancy Mace have her own journey, didn't call her to task, didn't say anything, just said, hey, I've been where you're at. I'm a survivor too. I, I hope you get through it. And that's how it should have been. And it's just, you know, I don't want to harp on it anymore. You get the point. And and I'm sure many of you agree that Nancy Mace uh, was not being raped, shamed, as she claimed, and was being asked a legitimate question about how she could support a candidate, regardless of her background. But her background makes it even more of a question. Like, how do you square that? Uh, And her response was, if not predictable, (laughs) <laughs> you know, it, it's in line with what we are used to from her. I will say that George Stephanopoulos is not a person that shouldn't be criticized. I mean, everybody can be, but in this topic of conversation, she could have easily asked him kind of countered with him because he was a high level, I believe chief of staff at one point, but high level in um, president Bill Clinton's administration. During the height of Monica Lewinsky and many accusations of sexual assault, there's, he's been accused of rape. Uh, in his book from like 1999, George Stephanopoulos said some pretty bad things about these accusers. There is a lot that he could be criticized for that relates to this line of questioning. Well, George, how did you support Bill Clinton when whatever you want to say from there? This this incident, or this incident, or this one, but the angle she took was just completely inaccurate, wrong. It, it didn't make sense. I'm not going to say she can't feel what she wants to feel, but I, I think an outside 
anyone on the outside looking in didn't take this as shaming her for what happened to her. Yes. Could it be potentially her shaming her for her vote? Sure. Why not? It could have been that, but you know, you're, you're a politician. People are going to ask you about your vote and how you can support a candidate that does X, Y, and Z. If you can't handle that, you shouldn't be in politics. Um, And again, he has plenty he could be criticized about. And she didn't even mention that until she got on Twitter, you know, later on. So she did mention these things, but that's really what she could have come back at him with. Uh, But it feels like she just wanted to have faux outrage to try to detract from giving a horrible response, which she did about how she can support Donald Trump. So anyway, if you somehow missed that, you can go watch the clip for yourself. If you think I'm wrong, that's fine. Let me know. Maybe I'm missing something here. But from my own personal perspective of the interview and talking to other people I know and seeing comments online and and, and including people who thought Stephanopoulos was out of line, I just haven't seen anything that, that says that he was. Again, besides the fact like you could turn that question right back around on him as it relates to his past with Bill Clinton. That's the only one that I've seen that was like, hey, Yeah, no, that's actually, that's a good question. That is something that you could have called him out on. But this faux outrage, so you could avoid giving an answer, and then you were forced to give an answer, and it was terrible. Um, I mean, let's let's be honest. The real reason, I don't actually think she believes Trump is innocent of anything. I don't think she actually believes that civil uh, court judgments should be discounted. She's doing it because it's politically advantageous to her. Period. End of sentence. It bear it behooves Nancy Mace. It helps Nancy Mace by endorsing Trump, going all in on Trump. It helps her career to stay in politics and it it benefits her. And that is the real answer of why she's supporting him. The answer she gave was somehow worse than that, but, uh, that's the real reason. Nancy looks out for Nancy period. End of sentence. That is what it's all about. Thank you for hanging around. I appreciate everyone listening. Like I said, I hope to be back on Friday and Monday. Um, If not, just know uh, it's because I'm having a great time in Connecticut, enjoying time with my family. Uh, I will be having a great time regardless if I sneak away to record some episodes. But just again, a heads up. If you have a chance, please vote for Holy City Center in Best of Charleston. Just head to the city paper and you can go ahead and vote in as many or as few categories as you want. Uh, I want to thank Lindsay Marie Collins with LMC Sound System for producing this in every episode of Holy City Center Radio. I also want to thank Tyler Boone, whose music you hear in every episode. Hopefully, I'll be with you Friday, Monday, Wednesday, whatever day I return. Um, I can't wait to be back, but until then, good night and good luck. Good luck.